Good morning, First Church. Good morning. You all should recognize this man, and he was actually supposed to do announcements today. And when he expressed to me how bummed he was that he wasn't going to be able to be here today because he's called away on work, I assured him that his presence would be here. So, and I'm wearing um, a soccer jersey because Greg is a very supportive of the Euro Cup. So, anyway, so we'll get started on announcements. I can't wear this all the time. You won't pay attention. Um, first announcement I'm going to call up uh, Debbie Kanak for. Good morning. Good morning. I am for the second Sunday representing Maricopa Interfaith HIV AIDS Association and I would like to thank all the First Church for sponsoring the free HIV AIDS testing this Wednesday, June 27th from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And we are one of a thousand churches countrywide that is going to sponsor this particular event because we want to make it known that 1.2 million people are HIV positive. One in five, that's 25% of these people don't realize they're HIV positive. So, we are sponsoring it, and the rate of the positive black Americans are rising at three times the state average. We are not all infected, but we all are affected, because we all know someone who is HIV positive. And we all do need to be checked. No matter who you are, or where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. And we're so glad that you are here. And Miha would like to invite you back to this facility, the northeast corner, which is the double doors from the parking lot, on Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. for free HIV testing, free snacks, <coughs> And there's confidential HIV testing by Teros. And to remove any fear, they run a Q-tip around the inside of your mouth. There's no sticking, no blood, nothing. <laughs> and if you have any questions or would like more information, you can see Phil Ward with his hand up there, or Don Ashley after service. Thanks, Debbie. Um, our next announcement is from the Call to Care Coordinating Council, and we are privileged today to have the Reverend Dr. Rosalind Polston here, Associate Minister of the Tanner Chapel AME Church right here in Phoenix. So and she's going to come up and, and speak to you about the Call, call to Care uh, program that is today. Is that correct? Yes. Good morning. It is a joy and an honor to be able to be here, first of all, to just be in worship with you this morning. Uh, Tanner Chapel AME Church is right around the corner there. So I just left my service over there to run over here. Amen? So thank you for inviting me. But today I'm here for a specific reason as well, and it's to your call to care coordinating council. You know, we who are blessed to be living at such a time as this, we are being called by God, I do believe, to serve as best we can to those who are less fortunate than we are. And today we're going to be looking at how Tanner Chapel has been very blessed with ministries to be able to go out and work with the greater uh, Phoenix area as well as working with Duet, which is our partners in health and aging. And being able to bring those two ministries together so that we can greater serve the homebound seniors within our Arizona community. 
So I'm praying that you'll stop by down in the Anthony Lounge at 12 o'clock so that we can share with you some of the things that are happening and to be able to exchange names and and, and hopefully we can all come together once again to do this much needed uh, ministry. Thank you so much for having me. And before I go any further, uh, if, do we have visitors here today? And if you are a visitor, could you please raise your hand? We have a small gift for you. Keep your hands up in the air, and, and uh, the bag ladies, the bag and gentlemen will come around and give you your gift. Um, all right, uh, a couple of big announcements, and I'm reading these, obviously, but from the green sheet, so I hope you'll reference this. Uh, take it home, you know, put it in your refrigerator or wherever you, you put it so that you can really pay attention during the, the coming uh, week. First Church turns 95. Plan to join us next Sunday, July 1st. Is next Sunday really July? Yes, it is. Yep. Uh, so we're going to be celebrating the 95th birthday of this church uh, in Pilgrim Hall following morning worship service. Big event in the church life here. Also, poetry uh, meeting on June 25th. That is tomorrow at 7 o'clock in Libby Parlor. Group is led by uh, poet Jack Evans, our own Jack Evans. Raise your hand, Jack, for those of you that don't know Jack. <laughs> If you like poetry, if you write poetry, if you want to learn more about spiritual writings or just like to listen, this is a great group to come and be part of. So the last announcement I have is concerning uh, Wilson School. And this is not on your uh, green sheet. So this is uh, happening, though, next week. Our special mission offering will go toward our Wilson School mission. And you're probably all familiar with that. We collect... Uh, um, Christmas goodies for Wilson School, and, and we, we help out uh, Wilson School in general throughout. So uh, next week, the, the, the communion or mission offering is going to go to Wilson School. We will use whatever we collect for Wilson School projects, including our upcoming back-to-school uh, program books, uniforms, backpacks, etc., that supply drive, which you'll have an opportunity to contribute to as well, and the annual Christmas party. So there'll be more details about both of those things, obviously, in the weeks to come. But next week, your communion offering, your mission offering, will go to Wilson School. Um, that's it. Any other um, announcements from the congregation? I also wanted to point out this flyer. I hope you've all noticed this flyer in your program. It, it, it gives a few details about our interim, intentional interim minister that will be joining us the first Sunday in August. Uh, so this just gives you a little, a little taste about uh, who uh, Reverend Wally is and helps us all on learning on pronouncing his name. So definitely pay attention to that. By the time he gets here, August 5th, there'll be a test. <laughs> Let us worship God. Please join in the union, unison centering prayer, which is printed on the order of worship on the first page. As you hold us in the palm of your hand, loving God, may we continue to see your strength revealed in the faces of our neighbors, our friends, and those around us in need. May we be inspired to act in your name. Amen.
Good morning, First Church. Thank you, Randall. Aren't we blessed to have such wonderful acolytes in Ethan and Anthony? Will you join me now in our invitation to worship, which is on the front page of your order of worship. As those who have been rescued and saved, let us give thanks to God, whose faithful love lasts forever. Some of the saved had gone out on the ocean in ships, making their living on the high seas. There they saw God's wondrous works in the depths of the sea. There a mighty storms brought the waves high as the sky and crashed down to the depths. So they cried out to their Lord in the distress. God quieted the storm to a whisper, and the waves were hushed. Let all be thankful for God's faithful love and wondrous works for all people. Come, let us worship God. And now let us join our hearts and minds together in hymn number 441, Jesus, Pilot Me. Responsive prayer of confession and the Lord's Prayer, which is on page two. Keeper of lives, you know the hardness and the gentleness of human hearts. Through the storms of life that bring suffering and fear, joy and laughter, teach us to turn to you for all we need so that we may be a loving support for others in need. Grant to us the courage and strength to be the people that belong to you. Remind us daily of your unconditional forgiveness for all that we have done to touch others and to ourselves. All this we ask in the words that Jesus taught us to say when we pray.
Friends, let us be in silence for quiet reflection. Let us feel the Spirit of God moving in our souls. Listen to the Spirit speaking of hope and wholeness. Trust the promises God has made that new life is our inheritance. If there are moments in this past week that we regret, if we have failed to forgive, or if we felt lost, give, let us give it to God now. Let us be in silence. My friends, Jesus has told us, do not be afraid, little flock, for God has given you the kingdom of heaven. Here in this moment and this place, the spirit of gentleness moves in our midst. Forgiveness, mercy, hope, and love are gifts of God given freely and unconditionally to each and every one of us. Join me now. No longer lost, we have found our way home, surrounded by God's peace, by God's grace, by God's love. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen. Let us, as a community of believers, share with each other a moment of friendship and a peace of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, may peace be with you. And also with you. Please greet each other. We don't give anyone any reason to be offended about anything so that our ministry won't be criticized. Instead, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in every way. We did this with our great endurance through problems, disasters, and stressful situations. We went through beatings, imprisonments, and riots. We experienced hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. We displayed purity, knowledge, patience, and generosity. We served with the Holy Spirit, genuine love, telling the truth, and God's power. We carried the weapons of righteousness in our right hand and our left hand. 
We were treated with honor and dishonor and with verbal abuse and good evaluation. We were seen as both fake and real, as unknown and well-known, as dying, and look, we are alive. Here ends the reading. Will the children come forward for the children's moment? Hey. No, we're not going to sit down today. We're going to stand up. Up, up, up. Up, up, up. Are there others? You want to come down? Well, come on. Here she comes. Here, you can hold hands with her. Let's hold hands here. Okay. So, we're going to tell the congregation a story, and they're going to help us. Actually, everybody's going to help us tell this story. Now, Jesus and the disciples were in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. Now, if you've ever been in a boat, have you been in a boat? Yeah? You've been in a boat. Okay. Then you know that the waves cause, cause the boat to rock a little. Let's rock. Come on, hold hands, Ethan. Now, let's rock. We're in the boat together. Okay. Well, what happened in this story is that they were out on the boat, and Jesus was with them, and Jesus went to sleep in the boat. You know, this kind of movement makes you sleepy. And then what happened is it started to rain. Now you keep rocking. The congregation, it started to rain. Hear the rain coming? Ooh, it started to rain. <laughs> and then the wind choir began to blow. And then there was lightning.
Today we lift up Mount Zion United Church of Christ in Cleveland, Ohio. This church helps the unemployed get jobs. They've partnered with churches and businesses together to train, mentor, and get the unemployed working. Since the beginning of the program, over 750 students have graduated, and about 90% of them have jobs when they graduate. The program is completely volunteer, run by mentors, and follow up with their students for the first year to help them stay on track. And now, will you pray with me? Creator God is our great joy and comfort that we cannot escape your holy presence, that no matter where we go or what we do, you will be with us, steadfast in your love and forgiveness. Around us, storms rage and the sea rises, and yet we do confess that sometimes we wish to hide from you our actions, our words, and our <clears throat> thoughts. We know that we are sometimes unworthy of your great unconditional love. We know that we get busy with the noise of our lives and become embroiled in our anxieties and fears, and sometimes forget that you are beside us in the storm. We lift up this day those in the world and in our midst that are hurting, lost, and lonely. We pray for those who are hungry, who are imprisoned by fear, and struggling to be free. Help those who are unable to feel your loving presence, dear God. Hear us now as we quietly name those who need your loving care or with whom we celebrate this day. Help us, loving God, to be better servants of your will. Help us to reach out with a helping hand to be instruments of your love and peace. Teach us to lift up prayers of gratitude, acknowledging our many blessings and gifts. Amen. 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 Now a reading from the Gospel from Mark 4. Later that day, when evening came, Jesus said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. They left the crowd and took him in the boat just as he was. Other boats followed along. Gale force winds arose and waves crashed against the boat so that the boat was swamped. But Jesus was there in the rear of the boat, sleeping on a pillow. They took him up and said, Teacher, don't you care if we're drowning? He got up and gave orders to the wind. And he said to the lake, Silence, be still. The wind settled down and there was a great calm. Jesus asked them, Why are you frightened? Don't you have faith yet? Overcome with awe, they said to each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're going to sing now um, hymn 173. If you could stand, if you are able, we're going to sing verses 1 and 2.
we're still here. Woo! Things will be different, as you probably already noticed. <laughs> but we know in our hearts that the church is not the building or the pastor. The church is the people. And we're already here to love one another, to worship God, and to serve others. So let's get to work. Let's build a new vision, a new beginning, and a new future. What say you? Amen. So now will you pray with me? Ever speaking, ever changing God, be with us now as we transition and move forward within the tradition of our denomination and within the history of our church. Open our ears and hearts to what you would have us be. Amen. Amen. So here we are with the disciples in a tiny boat. And they were small in those days. Of course, people were small. We're in a tiny boat on the Sea of Galilee when a mighty windstorm arose. Now the sea, sometimes called a lake, but it's quite large, is famous for surprise storms that can be very violent. We're not talking about Lake Pleasant here. The Sea of Galilee is nearly 700 feet below sea level. It's the lowest freshwater lake on Earth. The location of the Sea of Galilee is in the Jordan Rift, with steep hills on all sides. Winds sometimes funnel through the east-west valleys and come down from the Golan Heights in the east. One such storm in, in 1992 sent 10 foot high waves crashing on the seaside town of Tiberias, causing significant damage to the city. So for the scriptures to say that the disciples were concerned is a serious understatement. Now Jesus was very tired. He'd had a long day of preaching by the sea. After the multitudes began to drift home for dinner, the disciples asked him to go through it all again because they didn't understand what he had told. Now it's nighttime. No wonder he got into the boat and immediately fell asleep. Then suddenly the boat is caught in a dangerous storm and the disciples are terrified. Now this is a story from long ago. But like all the stories in the Bible, this is a story about us today. We too are afraid of the wind and the waves that trouble our own fragile vessels our lives, our families, our church, our city, our nation. We're human, and we fear disapproval, rejection, failure, illness, loss, our own death, the death of those dear to us, and the potential death of the communities we cherish. Presbyterian minister Mike Linval writes, that this story of fear and danger and the loving but firm response by Jesus offers a metaphor for our own vulnerability and our longing for the divine presence that calms us both and the storm. Linval adds that this is about how we need to rediscover and trust the one who can calm the storms that rage, rage about us. And there are a lot of storms around us. We're faced with many challenges of our state and our nation these days. One of the storms that we will be hearing more about after the presidential election is our state and national prison systems. The topic is going to be a big storm with a lot of winds blowing in all directions. Now each of us is free, as Americans and as Christians, to make up our own mind on the topic. And heaven knows we're independently minded here at First Church. <laughs> I might add that we're also free 
And it's safe here to change our minds. Personally, I have changed a lot on this topic. I used to be a hard-on-crime person, but now I've seen where it leads. I'm of a different mind now because the awful fact is that the United States has only 6% of the world's population, and yet we have 25% of the world's prisoners. Wow. Worldwide, countries incarcerate about 125 <coughs> people per 100,000 in the population. Yet in the U.S., the rate is 743 per 100,000. That's by far the highest in the world. We have, in this country, more than 2 million people in prisons. And we're spending $200 billion a year to keep them there. As Democratic Senator James Webb of Virginia recently said, either we have the most evil people on earth living in the United States, or we're doing something dramatically wrong in how we approach criminal justice. Now, our country started doing something dramatically wrong in the 1980s. That was when President Reagan launched the war on drugs. Congress passed laws and imposed mandatory minimum sentences for minor drug offenses. Many states passed three strikes and you're out laws. And many states passed harsh, yet tough on crime laws. Now we've often talked in this sanctuary about welcoming the stranger and caring for those in need. It's time that we need to start thinking about these people in need. There are entire communities, mostly rural and white, whose economic growth and stability are based on prisons. Civil rights activist and attorney Michelle Alexander says that most new construction of prisons has been in, in these small communities. And although prisons are often advertised as providing far more benefits to their communities than they actually deliver, the reality is that many of these communities now view private prisons as essential to their economic health. There are prisons in small communities in Arizona, rural towns, that you've probably never even heard of. And they're so small, they're not even on most maps. It's to a private prison's advantage to maximize the number of people incarcerated and to keep them that way. Private prisons do not provide job training, reentry preparation, and other programs to reduce recidivism and enhance successful return to families and communities. How do we make sense of the fact that it's cheaper to pay for four years of tuition at Princeton University than to incarcerate someone. And yet we're willing to do it over and over again to pay this exorbitant social and financial cost. Alexander writes that the true solutions will have to begin with the change of our entire mindset. It would be nice to implement programs that just returned the incarceration rates of the 1970s before the war on drugs and the Get Tough movement began. But if we did that, Alexander says, we would have to release four out of five of the people in prison today. Four out of five. And a million people employed by the criminal justice system would lose their jobs. We already have a deeply serious unemployment problem. To be realistic about ending the system means grappling with its scale. It's going to require a new public consensus that the lives of poor kids and minorities are equally valued as the lives of the kids populating our college campuses. 
and we will have to face the fact that there are more African American people under correctional control today than were enslaved in the 1850s. In some states, 90% of the people sent to prison on drug charges are African American. And yet, drug use among whites is similar to that of minorities. Churches should take a major role in the coming windstorm of prison reform. As Alexander points out, we need a new mindset. We need the mindset of Jesus who says, why are you afraid? Have you no faith? The 46 churches of our region of the United Church of Christ are now calling for the abolition of private prisons in the Southwest Conference. That's Arizona, New Mexico, and El Paso. Individuals and churches are invited to join this initiative to partner with other faith communities and to advocate for more humane and effective approaches to criminal justice. If you are interested in participating, see me for more information. Friends, we are not in this boat alone. We need to travel with Jesus to the other side of the lake where we can find a new perspective on this large and complex problem. Traveling on the Sea of Galilee to the other side in Jesus' day meant going into Gentile territory, which meant risking one's life among the foreigners. But Jesus is reaching out to the stranger, even the enemy. Now we've talked in this sanctuary about welcoming the stranger and caring for those in need. We took action during the storms over Arizona Senate Bill 1070. We stood for the DREAM Act. We've held funerals for those cast out by other denominations. We've ordained women, gays, lesbians, and transgender people. We've built homes, collected food, and donated money. We've marched in parades, stood in protest, and spoken out at rallies. From the very beginning, we've been a church of social justice. 95 years of social justice. Even though it has cost us greatly and will continue to do so. Now as we look at our no longer supportable prison systems, there's a mighty storm brewing, and it's a big, frightening one. A storm of racism, bias, and justice. But, as legendary British race car driver Sir Sterling Moss once said, to achieve anything, you must be, pre be prepared to dabble on the boundary of disaster. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we're all in this boat together. Let us row to the best of our ability against the winds of racism, fear, and injustice. As Baptist theologian William Newton Clark once wrote, faith is the daring of the soul to go further than it can see. Amen. Amen.
are all in one big boat together, aren't we? Yeah. And as everyone knows, if you've ever been in a boat, especially a rowboat, uh, you, you need people on both sides of the boat to row. And so I just want to add the, my commercial message to remind folks to stick together and to stay with us through this process. Um, especially the next few weeks as we anticipate and await the arrival of our new minister. Um, if we lose any one of us, um, it'll be harder to roll the boat. And if you get too many on one side, you just spin around in a circle. So I just want to remind you all to stay with, stay with this family and hang in there. Um, we've got an exciting time ahead of us. And we need all the progressives that we can um, that we can manage in here because we do have some big issues coming up against us. And I give thanks, and I hope you give thanks right now um, for who we all are, and that we have that opportunity to stand together and to stand for justice and to minister to others out there that, that need us. And remember, any one of you that leaves for whatever reason, is like, for me, is like missing a min another minister. Because you're all, not just my friends, but you're my ministers. And I would miss each and every one of you. I would miss any one of you that left. Um, so we all need to stay together so we can all be each other's ministers. And now let's show um, God and each other a little thanks and prayer.
serve you, serving others. Amen. 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 Before we sing, we'll be blessing the water. As a member of the Mission and Outreach team, I want to thank everyone who contributed to this great bounty up here. We're helping a lot of people who, quite frankly, don't know how to help themselves. And that's what we're here for. Holy God, as the days grow hotter and hotter in our desert home, we are mindful that there are those in our community with no shelter and limited access to basic resources. As a community, in partnership with our Lutheran neighbors, we are gathering water and snacks to help alleviate the suffering of the homeless this summer. We ask that you bless this collective water and sustenance as we seek to care for others. Amen. Let us join together in my fly. Life flows on in endless song, hymn number 476.